Hello, everyone. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening to some of you. Um, thank you so much for joining today's webinar on the collective voice of consumers in the financial sector. Um, we are very excited to have you here, and, and we're all looking forward to today's uh, presentations and discussions. Um, but just a couple of housekeeping items before we before we begin. Um, just to say, uh, of course, we would have loved to hold this event in person where, where we can moderate a, a lively discussion and, and a question and answer session. But since that's obviously not possible, we are using this, this webinar platform. And you'll see that there is a chat function in the bottom right corner of your screen. And we encourage you to, to use that to share any insights or observations that you have as you listen to today's presentation. Um, and please also use this function to submit any questions you have for the speakers, uh, because we've set aside time um, about halfway through and at the end at the end of the webinar for a question and answer. And the other thing I just wanted to note is that immediately following the webinar, you'll receive a link to a feedback form. And we would really appreciate your honest feedback on this event and also on CGAP's plans for the future of this work stream and any ideas that you have. Now, next up, I wanted to show the agenda for today. Uh, next slide. Thank you. Um, so, uh, Herard Kasea from CGAP and Helena Laurent will, from Consumers International will give a welcome in just a minute. Then I'll present an overview of the topic and CGAP's approach thus far. And then we'll hear four mini presentations offering different perspectives on the role of the collective consumer voice in the financial sector. Uh, two consumer associations, uh, one regulatory authority, and one international development partner. Uh, then we'll hear from Helena again, who will present the research that Consumers International has carried out with its members these past few months. And then Mary Griffin with CGAP will present uh, uh, various models and tools that are used, are being used or could be used by regulators to engage with the consumer perspective. Uh, and then finally, I will moderate a question and answer session through the chat function. Uh, and then Herard will wrap up. So uh, with that, I would like to introduce uh, Herod Kutsea and Helena Laurent, who will set the stage for the rest of today's discussion. Hello, everybody. I'm Herod Kutsea from CGAP, and it's a great pleasure for me to be here with all of you today. Thank you for joining us today. We are pleased to welcome you to this webinar, which is in partnership with Consumers International. This webinar is on elevating the collective voice of consumers in the financial sector. Now, for those of you who are, who are not so familiar with CGAP, we are an independent think tank housed at the World Bank with a mission of improving the lives of poor people by spurring innovations and advancing knowledge and solutions that promote responsible, sustainable, inclusive financial markets. We are also a global partnership of over 30 development organizations, including bilateral donors, multilateral institutions, development finance institutions, and private foundations. And it gives me great pleasure to welcome some of our uh, members at this specific webinar. As Matthew will explain further in a minute, CGAP has long prioritized consumer protection as a core element of financial inclusion and a critical lever that can support improved consumer protection is the collective voice of consumers. We feel strongly that without the strengthened and more prominent consumer perspective in the marketplace, regulators and providers may not feel accountable to consumers, especially those who come from poor and marginalized segments of society. And this is where the challenge lies. How do you elevate the voice of consumers to help ensure that the consumer perspective is represented in decision making, in the regulatory process, and in the practices of providers? And how do you do it when you are trying to do it for the poorest segments of society? I am looking forward to hearing from our partners at uh, Consumers International about the research they've conducted with their members on their involvement in financial sector issues 
I'm also looking forward to presentations from CGAP colleagues, GIZ, the FCA, the Consumer Council of Zimbabwe, and the Brazilian Institute of Consumer Defense. And once again, I'm glad to see that many CGAP members are on the call. There is a great potential in bringing together the financial inclusion world with the world of consumer advocacy. I hope this is the beginning of a longer conversation. You, Helen. We uh, restart with a very warm welcome to everybody on the uh, call and a thanks for joining and taking an interest in what we believe is and sincere thanks to CGAP for enabling us to explore this, certainly in my first year as Director General of Consumers International. Um, could we go to the next slide, please? This is a brief introduction to just who we are as Consumers International. We're a membership organization, and we bring together over 200 consumer advocates, uh, consumer advocacy organizations in more than 100 countries around the world. Our focus is empowering consumers and protecting consumers, and our goal is to build a fair, a safe, and a sustainable marketplace. Now, um, I think it's important to flag that all of these consumer advocacy groups focus on a wide range of topics um, where finance is critically important. Next slide, please. While we are across 100 countries, we are united by a set of guidelines and principles which were adopted in 1985. Consumers International contributed to the development of these and they are now monitored at UNCTAD since 2016. You'll see how broad ranging they are. Um, they are, we feel, increasingly important and relevant as we look forward and the way in which digital technologies uh, will shape uh, sectors and our need to meet the sustainable development goals. And it's particularly relevant for vulnerable consumers and consumers in crisis. Um, and as we speak during the pandemic, we are seeing that increasingly so. Next slide, please. Uh, a brief snapshot of some of the topics that we focus in on um, with consumer-centered financial services at the center. Next slide, please. Um, and after 60 years of work, this is our 60th anniversary, uh, we are proud to say that we have uh, brought our members together around the world, but also represented the consumer voice internationally, for example, at the G20 or through World Consumer Rights Day, which brings together everybody every year in March, um, in standards and in collaborating with consumer protection agencies or in new insight and increasingly in projects and uh, ways to deepen the impact. Next slide, please. A beautiful slide which we will not go through, but just gives you a brief sense of uh, the breadth of activities our members. This is literally just from the past couple of months as our members stepped up to support consumers during pandemic. Uh, they are sharing information. They are supporting consumers uh, with uh, the monitoring the marketplace um, externally and in very difficult financial circumstances. So as we go into the rest of this uh, presentation, it's fantastic to focus then within this picture into the work of low and uh, uh, middle income country consumer advocates and really think about where next. Back to you. Oh, Hel Helena, the, there's something, there's something. Oh, sorry, Helena, the, the sound, the sound is very distorted. Oh, sorry, we can't. Sorry about that. Um, some, as you started speaking in, in slow motion. Um, but you will hear more from Helena very soon uh, when she presents the, the research that Consumers International has, has done. Uh, so I will just um, 
spend the next few minutes giving some background on, on how CGAP arrived at this topic, uh, why we think it's important, and, and how we are approaching it. And um, thank you uh, very much, Helena and Harrod, uh, for, for, your, for your welcome. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. So as, as Harold explained, for those of you who are not familiar with CDF, um, our overarching objective is advancing financial inclusion. And we want to advance financial inclusion because of the contributions it can make toward increasing resilience and helping people in poverty seize opportunities, which can ultimately improve their well-being. Um, that's the, the outermost circle on this on this image. Um, and now consumer protection has always been an integral part of financial inclusion. Uh, because, of course, we do not want to expand access to just any type of financial service, but rather we want to expand the availability of responsibly and fairly provided services that actually help people reach their goals uh, rather than leading to harm. So we've worked for many years on strengthening consumer protection, uh, primarily through partnerships with regulators and providers. And in the past couple of years, we focused in on an emerging approach to financial consumer protection, uh, which is generally called outcomes-driven or outcomes-focused consumer protection. Uh, it can be a little tricky to explain this briefly, uh, what it means and, and how it differs from a traditional approach, but at a very high level, it's about shifting the focus of consumer protection away from a box-ticking exercise that looks mostly at whether or not providers comply with a set of prescriptive rules, and instead moving towards an approach that is more focused on what actually happens to consumers when they engage with providers. Um, and as we've dug deeper into this outcomes approach and learn more about the countries that are moving in this direction, including the UK and South Africa, uh, it's become very clear that the consumer voice is a critical element, both in pushing for stronger consumer protections and also for providing input to regulators and providers about what is working in the marketplace and what is not working. So in this way, the consumer voice and the outcomes approach can help reinforce each other. Uh, next slide, please. So what exactly are we talking about when we say the collective voice of consumers? Um, so here, the collective voice of consumers um, brings together and elevates diverse and segmented interests of individual consumers to more powerfully and effectively represent the consumer perspective in the marketplace. And so just a few things I would like to highlight here in this uh, this definition that, that we are working with. Um, this, the collective angle is really important because we're not talking about individual voices speaking to their individual providers. Um, while we often think of asymmetry that at this at this level between consumers and providers, um, asymmetries of power or asymmetries of information, uh, we often think of those at the level of a transaction. But if we zoom out, the, those imbalances are also apparent on a larger scale at the level of, of a market or a country. And so here we're really focused on this collective aggregated consumer perspective at the level of the marketplace. And there's also a, a slight nuance between the words customer and consumer. So at least the way that we've been thinking about it, um, customer implies that a relationship already exists between an individual and a financial service provider. Uh, whereas consumer can potentially more broadly refer to those who are already included, as well as those as well as those who continue to face financial exclusion. So that's part of why we why we've landed on this terminology. Uh, next slide, please. So why are we focusing on this? Um, hopefully, since you are all uh, logged into this. Um, to this webinar, we don't need to convince you. But uh, just to, to reiterate, uh, quite simply, it's because the, in most cases, the deck is not stacked in favor of consumers. Uh, and it's even less in favor of poor, vulnerable, and marginalized consumers. Uh, and here, here are uh, a, few, a few thoughts. So providers invariably enjoy greater access to and influence over regulators and lawmakers than, than consumers do. Uh, firms use their abundant resources to organize themselves into associations, which can facilitate more effective communication between uh, the private sector or industry and government, uh, which often occurs through lobbying. Uh, in contrast, the voices and concerns of consumers are, are not as likely to be represented in, the, in rulemaking procedures. Uh, partly because the, the benefits of doing so are widely distributed and the costs, the individual costs are very high. Uh, 
Um, and secondly, the, the financial sector is very complex and it's becoming even more so. And this can make it very challenging for under-resourced consumer associations and civil society organizations to effectively engage in the policymaking process. So we see an opportunity here to leverage the expertise that the financial inclusion community has uh, in, in the complexity of regulating digital finance and, and leveraging that expertise to help consumer associations and civil society to equip them to engage in policymaking. Um, now, another reason that we think it is, it's uh, important to, to look into this topic is because historically or traditionally, um, the financial inclusion sector hasn't really paid very much attention in general. There are, of course, exceptions, exceptions but in general, it's, it's, uh, hasn't, it has not paid much attention to this, what we think is a, a critical component of a fair marketplace. Uh, so, so we focused on demand side customer research, but it's not exactly the same thing. Um, demand side research provides a picture at a moment in time, but it doesn't create an opportunity um, or structure for consumers to express their needs and concerns in the long run. Uh, the, 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 sec the, the theory of change on consumer protection within financial inclusion often relies heavily on A, convincing providers that it's in their interest to treat consumers well, or B, providing technical assistance to policymakers to help them develop and enforce uh, consumer protection regulation. And while these are both valuable investments, of course, they do not sufficiently leverage the potential of consumers themselves to help shape policy and practice. So in general, the engagement with consumers or customers has been limited to financial education and to a lesser extent, individual empowerment. But we think there's enormous potential in considering empowering consumers as a collective force. And in the absence of strong consumer representation, uh, donors end up standing in for the consumer perspective and sometimes speaking on their behalf, which can be uncomfortable and not always effective. Now, finally, we see great opportunity here because, uh, and, and we're interested in taking advantage of these new opportunities to strengthen the collective voice of consumers. Uh, so social media, the availability and access to data, such as complaints data, for example, and the fact that, that many regulators are actually more engaged. Um, these all present potential avenues to elevate the voice of, of consumers in policymaking and in the marketplace. Um, now, finally, we, we, do, we don't claim that uh, strengthening the collective consumer voice is going to guarantee that we arrive at some utopian financial sector where everyone is treated with absolute respect and fairness. Um, uh, we're not that naive, but we, we don't see how it's possible to get there if consumers themselves, uh, especially the poorest and most vulnerable, uh, don't have a seat at the table. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. So just to briefly explain how, we, how we're approaching this and what, how we've gone about this, uh, this research. So we've done this landscaping um, exercise with Consumers International to understand to what extent consumer groups are working on financial sector issues today. Uh, and you'll hear much more about this from Helena in just a minute. And then at the same time, Mary Griffin has led research on ways that regulators are embedding the consumer voice in policymaking, which she will speak about in a minute as well. And then in the coming year, we plan to select models that offer potential and, and test them in partnership with either consumer groups or regulators. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and so since our role at CGAP is, is primarily not about implementation, but rather developing and sharing knowledge, um, we're engaging in this work with, a, with an eye toward developing some type of guidance for different stakeholder groups who can then scale up and, and carry this work forward. And so we're thinking about these three different um, uh, stakeholder groups, consumer associations and civil society, uh, regulators and development partners, and trying to identify ways that, that they can help support uh, the strengthening and the elevation of, of the collective consumer voice. And here are just a few bullets of potential ideas about ways that, the ways that we might go about doing that. Now, um, before the next session, um, the, the next slide I just want to show are some ideas um, for, for questions for, that we'd like to hear your responses to in the chat box. Um, so feel free, of course, to share anything that comes to your mind uh, as, as you're listening to the presentations. And I see that there's already a, a few 
a few comments being made. Um, but also, if you need a little prompt, uh, we put together these three questions that we would also be grateful to hear your thoughts on about um, the biggest um, uh, but most manageable challenges facing consumers and their representatives uh, in term, as, as those challenges relate to policy making. Um, in what areas would there be most fruitful opportunities to strengthen the collective consumer voice? And what do you think CGAP can do to enhance the collective voice in financial consumer protection? And, and what can our role be? Great. So um, with that, we will move to the next section, next portion of the webinar. Um, so next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so now we're going to hear four um, quote unquote lightning talks about different experiences advancing the collective consumer voice. Um, so we are going to start with Rosemary Siachitema, who is the executive director of the Consumer Council of Zimbabwe. Um, so Rosemary, uh, you can begin. And Antonique, if you can move to Rosemary's slide. Perfect. All right, Rosemary. Thank you very much, Matt, and hi to everybody. Um, in 2014, um, in Zimbabwe, there was a FinScope study survey that was done, which Consumer Council of Zimbabwe participated in. And the results that came out of it were very telling in that a big portion of consumers um, were not part of the banking system or in any financial institutions, whether they are the banking or insurance. And most people uh, would put their monies under the pillow. Uh, the telling bit was where maybe I would draw the challenges uh, that are there for uh, the bigger bulk of the uh, consumers, most especially those who uh, live outside um, urban areas and more into the rural areas. One of the biggest challenges has been that um, more and more as we push consumers uh, uh, towards cashless or cash light, uh, it means that uh, consumers have to have access uh, to the digital environment, uh, doing their business uh, through uh, the computer or uh, using their cell phones and uh, things like that. The biggest challenge is the cost of doing business. Uh, generally, um, costs uh, of data or using the computer would be um, fairly something that people can afford. But if you're talking of a country that is experiencing very heightened economic problems, you find that uh, things change overnight, cost of doing business becomes really very difficult. So most of the public cannot um, avail themselves to data bundles. It is very costly. Um, in a country where there is um, a continuous liquidity challenge, it means that people have no access to cash. So they have to use the internet or use their telephones. And uh, because of the cost of doing business is very high, um, it means that they are excluded from participating in this um, uh, environment. The uh, economy is very unpredictable, so you don't know what's going to happen from one day to the next. Banks and financial institutions become more opaque in crisis situations. You don't know what the charges are on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, you don't know whether uh, if you transact uh, any money, your money will reach its destination and the turnaround for those um, to correct that uh, is not uh, near 24 hours. Um, sometimes it takes longer than that and that is very inconveniencing of the public. The regulation is very poor, especially when you're talking about regulation of monies that are being sent uh, via internet um, uh, with regards to those that you do directly with the bank. And so um, uh, consumers uh, have long periods of time when they don't know what has happened to their finances. And then most financial institutions, their process for uh, complaints handling is another area that um, is not shared with consumers. So you, um, most consumers will not know how to um, ascend uh, their complaints, or even if they do, uh, they never are aware of how long it will take. So those are some of the general uh, challenges that people, uh, most consumers will have. Uh, regulatory bodies, unfortunately, uh, sometimes 
uh, because maybe they know which side their bread is buttered. They will. Uh, they don't um, support consumer protection as much as they should, and it's one of the bigger problems because um, then uh, you do not have a body that adjudicates between consumers and service providers. Now, as a, 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 a consumer body that is working on behalf of consumers, our role is um, that we have found ourselves in the strategies that we've used is that we, 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 we deliberately sit on various uh, boards and committees so that the consumer voice is heard. For example, uh, on the telecommunications board, whether the Arab uh, Reserve Bank of Zimbabwe or the Bankers Association and other such um, um, uh, organizations where we can ensure that the consumer voice is heard. Uh, we work with regulators uh, to advance consumer education and in this case because most of these regulators have got a component of consumer protection so we jump onto that to uh, to partner with them to get to go out as far as wide as possible and not only concentrate in urban areas we then go out into the rural areas to ensure that consumer education reaches that far we partnered uh, with uh, some NGOs to ensure that issues of um, uh, people knowing how to budget and how to uh, assess uh, the efficacy of, um, of banks or where to put their money in, we work with organizations to do that. We have constituted what we call consumer action clubs, which we um, are dotted around the country. At the moment, we have around 366 action clubs that are domiciled in different communities and we use these as receptacles for consumer education, uh, financial education, budgeting and things like that. We find that um, this kind of direct dealing with uh, consumers in their own communities, uh, it, 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 you have a, a group of consumers who are very much aware of their rights and are able to um, stand up for themselves in the different places that they are at. Uh, we have um, worked with insurance uh, companies to uh, do uh, financial education, especially targeted at um, insurance. And in a volatile economy like this, consumers have found that their policies, um, you know, after a short period of time, uh, they don't mean anything because they have lost value. So we were part of um, a, a research that was done to see how this can be mitigated against, uh, mitigated against to support uh, consumers. Hey, Rosemary, I'm sorry, sorry to interrupt, but uh, we just have, we just have one minute to, to wrap up, sorry. Very much so. Measurable outcomes, we have pushed for the, inter uh, the enactment of the Consumer Protection Act that is very encompassing and what we hope is that a financial a consumer protection is going to be a priority in that. And we will continue to work with regulators so that they also institute consumer protection frameworks for their own, for their own sectors of the economy. And um, we have been in the forefront of interaction with banks to ensure that the cost of doing business is fair so that um, the poorer communities can uh, also access uh, banking and financial institutions. Um, I think basically uh, uh, that is what we have been actively doing at the Consumer Council of Zimbabwe. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rosemary. Thank you for that. Um, next up, we have Teresa Liporasi. Sorry, Lee Porasi, um, who is the executive director of the Brazilian Institute of Consumer Defense. Um, Teresa, please go ahead. Yes, good afternoon. Good morning from Brazil. Thank you, Consumers International and CGAP, for bringing to light an enormous and high impact problem in the lives of millions of consumers all over the world. I am confident that we can move on this agenda together. Well, in Brazil now, we have more than 6 million indebted and more than 30 million over-indebted consumers. 
it's not a new problem and it's a combination of different facts. Credit enhancement policies, we had a strong credit expansion without any guidance on the risks, without effective, effective financial education programs, just to illustrate uh, the rates between credit and GPD rose from 18% in 2003 to 49% in 2020. We have bank concentration. The five big banks dominate 85% of credit. And we have a growing household debt. DEX is completing 30 years this July, this month, and we have uh, approached, we have been approaching uh, this big problem of over indebtedness in Brazil, mainly, mainly producing evidence for more than a decade. Through research, we were able to identify, systematize, and present over indebtedness main causes. We have been exposing financial institutes abusive practices, aggressive marketing, misleading messages, wide information asymmetry concerning risks, regulatory gaps on the treatment of indebted consumers, and banks justifying high interest rates based on high default rates. In 2016, we conducted a survey with 1,100 consumers. 50% had already gone through an experience of debt. The majority has not able to solve their problem. The three main reasons banks do not negotiate debts with those who are not in arrears. Banks present proposals above the capacity of payments. And it's very frequently contracting a new credit to pay a previous one. Consumers do it to avoid the fall. This system has been consolidated in Brazil and it doesn't allow financial and social recovery definitely. And we are facing a perverse effect of income transfer to banks through interest during years. And to make it worse, in that people are usually blamed by society, by family. It's really a drama. In 2017, we realized that we had to humanize the problem if you want to make people and decision makers aware about it. We identified a potential case study among our members, and it took more than a year to have his problem partially solved. We conducted it as a real case study, checking hypotheses, confirming our analysis, and testing mechanisms for solving the problem. We also developed a 25-minute documentary. It was a perfect case, uh, a story about a professor with 30 years of academic activities whose income was 20 times the minimum wage, a giant debit, 120% of his income committed to credit payments for more than four years, and no debt in arrears. All the main ingredients were together in that case study, the absence of responsible credit policies, the absence of risk prevention mechanisms, regulatory gaps, absence of analysis and indicators to avoid indebtedness recurrence. This case and a 10 years background monitoring financial service in Brazil were used to build a narrative, a storytelling about how vulnerable consumers are regarding financial services. How big are the asymmetries between consumers and financial service institutes? And it's not applicable only to those with low education level. Consumers are victims of a predatory model of credit in Brazil. And this narrative has been used to develop communication materials to gain media attention, fact sheets to convince congressmen to promote public hearing at the National Congress, and all this to push forward uh, Bill 3515 that uh, is, was stopped in the Congress uh, since 2015. The bill, if approved, will guarantee recovery process through a payment plan that considers the essential minimum of 30% of consumers' income and other issues like transparency, ethical credit offers. Uh, the proposal follows a business recovery logic with an extension 
extrajudicial attempt to compose the total consumer debt through a debt payment plan. Of course, the bill approval is not enough for address this hard social problem, but it's an important begin. And right now we are facing a strong bank lobby because we are able to move the legislative process. Uh, it's really a David and Golia fight uh, for a consumer organization with uh, under resources, and uh, it's very difficult to say this this debate because we need a very uh, important technical background. And this is our experience that we'd like to share with you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Teresa. That was perfect. Um, and I just wanted to, as Anthony just said in the chat, uh, it, it, it seems that participants are not able to send uh, chats to all the other participants. So um, instead, if, if, you, if you go to send the chat to panelists, then one of us, one of the panelists here, will copy your chat uh, so, that, so the others can see it. So apologies for that. Next up, we are going to hear from Graham Collett, who is with the Financial Conduct Authority, um, where he is the manager of the Secretariat for the Financial Services Consumer Panel at the, at the UK FCA. So Graham, please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, so I've been asked to provide a regulator's view from the UK FCA on how we engage the consumer perspective. So there are uh, many consumer groups in the UK, um, mostly small ones, but also some larger ones such as Which, Age UK. Um, but all of them, even the largest, represent particular constituent groups uh, and all of them struggle for resource. So at the FCA, we do regularly engage with these groups. We have a consumer network where we engage with them collectively, and we also meet them independently, largely on an issues driven basis. However, because these groups struggle for resource and because they cover such wide areas in multiple markets, sectors and industries, there is a gap there for a specialist financial services focused consumer group. And this is where the financial services consumer panel comes in. So the consumer panel is one of the four uh, panels which advise the FCA from a particular stakeholder standpoint. Three panels, the other three, represent various elements of the industry interest. So there's a, a large firm uh, practitioner panel, a smaller firm's practitioner panel, and also a panel which represents the interest of the wholesale markets. And the fourth panel, of course, as I mentioned, represents consumers. So all of these panels have a statutory basis. So the FCA is required to have them by law, the same law which sets out the way in which the FCA functions. And I think that's quite important because it means the FCA can't decide not to engage with these panels on a whim or according to whoever is in charge at the time. The law says that we have a duty to consider representation from the panels. It doesn't say a lot else, so all of the panels have a formal terms of reference which are agreed with the FCA board, and this outlines their role more clearly. So the consumer panel. Uh, the consumer panel has a fuller role than the other panels because of the imbalance in power, uh, the asymmetry between the industry and the consumer landscape, something I think has been touched on already. So the industry lobbies on a number of fronts from firms and trade associations and is clearly quite powerful. And as we have seen, that isn't the case for consumer groups. So the consumer panel represents the groups of uh, the interests of all groups of financial services consumers. It's there to advise and challenge the regulator. The way in which it's constituted, so it currently has 12 members um, selected from an open process of recruitment, and these members are appointed for an initial three years and can serve up to two terms. They come from a range of different backgrounds. There are those who've had an advocacy background themselves, people with a legal background, economists, researchers, and also people who have had experience of working within the industry. The panel itself operates independently of the FCA, and it focuses on our strategic and operational objectives. It does have a secretariat who are FCA employees, and they support the panel in achieving those objectives. So what is the benefit? What, what benefits does the consumer panel bring to the table? Well, it's a set of experts that are on tap to advise and challenge us. 
and they can provide an early dialogue with us in the process of policy development and prevent the FCA getting too far into that development process without having a consumer perspective um, and enable us to kind of better present and better develop our policies. It's a set of checks and balances and it holds the FCA to account. And that dialogue can take place before the FCA goes external and ward off any potential issues that might develop through the policy development process. It's a bespoke resource, and that comes in an environment where the consumer landscape is very thinly stretched. So how effective is the panel? Um, so I guess this ebbs and flows according to the membership and the strength of the relationship with the FCA. Theirs is still one view of which we have many that which we can access. But on the whole, the panel provides robust and credible challenge. So just to finish with an example of, of where that challenge has, has, has proved to be particularly successful in the past. So a few years ago, the FCA conducted a review of the mortgage market. Um, and one of the elements of the proposals was for a new metric for firms to use when assessing the affordability. However, at the time, in the panel's view, that assessment was overly onerous and would therefore mean many creditworthy borrowers would not be able to obtain a mortgage. So as a result of a long process of dialogue, consultation also with external parties, etc., the FCA did modify its approach in the end. And I think that example and the many others really highlight how the consumer panel can effectively bring the consumer, pro uh, consumer perspective to regulatory process. Thank you. Thank you so much, Graham. That was fantastic. Um, next up, we are going to hear from Vita Sampel, who is a senior advisor for GIZ uh, based in Indonesia. Thank you, Vita. We're looking forward to hearing your, your speaking. Um, yes, thank you, Matthew. Um, and good afternoon or good evening from Indonesia. Um, let me also thank the organizers for having uh, GIZ represented in this interesting uh, webinar. Um, we'll be very happy to share some uh, snapshots from Southeast Asia. Um, I'm in charge of a technical assistance project on consumer protection, which is funded by the German government, and it works with the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, or ASEAN. Um, our project is actually part of a larger engagement of German development cooperation with the 10 ASEAN member states in the area of regional economic integration. And we're covering a number of projects devoted to competition policy as well, trade and services in agriculture and SME promotion. Um, all of this is set against the backdrop of ambitious and uh, at times also interlinked initiatives towards the ASEAN economic community, which strives to develop a dynamic and people-centered region that also generates benefits and prosperity for both businesses and consumers alike. And so it's with this much broader perspective that we as development partners to ASEAN believe also that consumer protection must be considered as an important and as an integral element of equitable and effective markets. In our project, we both facilitate regional dialogue on the subject and regional cooperation, whilst also supporting legal and institutional frameworks, as well as multi-stakeholder approaches in individual countries. Um, and we consider it critical to build not only business, but also consumer confidence in transacting in markets, both offline as well as now, as you know, increasingly online. Um, and in ASEAN, the regulatory landscape is fast evolving, but it's also at still quite uh, an infant stage in many countries. And uh, in many countries, stakeholders may not only have fairly little knowledge and competencies about technical subjects, including financial services and technologies, but they also may have generally a uh, limited understanding about the roles and responsibilities of the government, the private sector, and civil society within a functioning market economy. And our work spans a highly diverse region that, is as, uh, that spans countries as different as Laos, as the least developed country, and Singapore as a first world nation. And if we're looking at the three stakeholder groups, uh, we um, also observe that the collective consumer voice looks to be particularly weak in many of the countries. Uh, again, countries that are transitioning to a market economy like Laos, PDR and Cambodia have yet to even set up their own consumer associations. 
And financial consumer protection constitutes a major concern uh, that's also in light of uh, the growth of fintech, e-payments, online lending, and of course, as the other speakers have mentioned, let's not forget about the poorer segments of society and the vulnerable consumers outside of the urban areas. Um, if I'm taking another brief example of Indonesia, where we also see financial consumer protection to be of high importance, it progresses at a much faster pace than perhaps consumer protection in many other sectors. However, the efforts are also largely detached from those of the main consumer protection authority and financial consumer protection when it comes to consumer education and empowerment remains virtually untouched by consumer associations that are operating already. Uh, at the same time, we see that um, the local bodies that need to deal with the consumer disputes are often overwhelmed by the sheer number and complexity of complaints that are related to financial services. And what is essentially missing is a holistic, cross-sectoral, and more consumer-centric approach here. And so while in our project, we don't see financial consumer protection to be our sole priority, we do believe it can be a prime example to showcase the importance and the positive impact of consumer protection on both competitive as well as just markets. And this is, of course, provided that we can team up with other partners to raise more awareness, build capacities, financial literacy, unfair contract terms, complaints handling might be examples, and also that we undertake concerted and more inclusive endeavors to take up consumer concerns in policy dialogues and directions. Um, and in, and in this connection, perhaps we could highlight the emerging ASEAN Consumer Associations Network that could play a pivotal role in the exchange of experiences and good practices, uh, showing what services consumer associations can offer, how innovative tools could be better utilized, and how perhaps um, consumer associations can collectively and more proactively shape policy making in the long term. Uh, so with this, I, I think I would like to uh, close my brief input, and I look forward for this uh, to be uh, maybe the kickstart to further brainstorming and perhaps partnerships beyond uh, ASEAN uh, as well with both uh, CGAP and Consumers International. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sita. That was fantastic. And thank you to, to all of our panelists for, for sharing your experiences that added a lot to, to today's discussion. So thank you for joining us. Um, now I have the pleasure of reintroducing Helena Lero. Um, Director General of Consumers International, who is going to share with us the findings from the research that was led by Consumers International over the past few months uh, with their members. So back to you, Helena. Hi, can we try now? Yes, perfect, thank you. We, we can't hear you, Helena. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, now we can. Okay, not quite sure what's happening here. All right, do I need to restart? Uh, yes, we didn't hear anything. <laughs> okay, uh, fascinating. Yeah, um, take, I now have both take, my, take it from both the top. My, yeah, I now have both my phone <laughs> and my computer on not on mute. So between somewhere in there, something is working, which is good. Something um, is working. <laughs> something is working. This is good. Hi, everyone, and apologize for the apologies for the earlier issue. Uh, the presentation I'm about to show you comes from research by uh, Matt Jones, Jamie Solly, and Phil Hunt, uh, who formed the uh, Consumers International team putting this together. Um, if we could go to the next slide, 
essentially this work um, is about understanding the work of consumer advocates and consumer advocacy groups in low and middle income countries focused on uh, financial services. And what we did was um, out of the 200 uh, groups that form the membership for Consumers International, 132 of those are within low and middle income countries. Uh, we surveyed and had responses to a survey from 36 of those and then supplemented that with interviews. Also interviewing uh, some consumer advocacy groups in high income countries. You can see the ones who responded in yellow stars and those who provided uh, very kindly some uh, feedback and insight from their perspective in red. Now, the uh, groups that responded to us are typically small, whereas Choice or Which might have 200 staff. Uh, Zimbabwe, for example, will have 20 and uh, will rely on volunteering, um, but then reach out to a much larger network through a variety of mechanisms. They all work on a range of topics, of course. Um, they will raise food safety and security, education, for example, but 80% of them work on financial services. And we also ask them a little bit about telecoms and data protection as comparison. They're in direct contact with consumers in a variety of ways, as you've heard, and receive multiple consumer complaints and contact points to understand not just the collective, but um, individual needs as well, and work with consumers on individual cases. Many of them are funded by consumer uh, subscriptions, but they may also be supported by government, though that can be uh, inconsistent. They're often involved in official structures for consumer protection and find those very influential when they are regularly organized. Uh, slightly fewer uh, responding were involved in structures for financial services. Now, in the rest of the survey, and what I'll show you now, is a little bit of some of the issues they are experiencing and uh, what we saw as some of the strategies and opportunities. On this page, we have uh, the range of topics that came as most important. You can see contract terms, hidden fees, uh, and there are a follow-on list of multiple issues from over-indebtedness, high remittance costs, violation of data privacy, aggressive marketing, failure to deliver or exclusion from services, and scams. Next slide, please. The key areas, though, of action and focus, which are, of course, interlinked, are those you can see on the screen, or I hope you can in front of you. Um, and we'll talk about each one of these in turn. If you compare the strategies that consumer advocates use for financial services with those used for telecoms or data, um, there's far more awareness raising to get people um, understanding financial services and involved in them. Uh, with data protection, there's far more uh, pilot approaches, we noticed, which we think is interesting. Um, now, for each of these, we looked at a snapshot. So let's see if we can do a whirlwind tour. Next slide, please. The first of these is complaints handling. It provides a very direct connection um, and perhaps sometimes the first point of call where a consumer will be uh, aware. Um, this is where we provide assistance, guidance, sometimes even submit the complaint. Of course, there's been a vast increase given the pandemic. What's interesting is seeing how technology can be used. For example, Côte d'Ivoire and Le Consommateur Éclairé, which is the enlightened consumer. Um, and the example, of course, of Peru, which is uh, unusual in that uh, it's rewarded around dispute resolution. Um, and I think it's particularly interesting at the moment that you can see startups benefiting uh, because they actually address some of the issues and complaints uh, it's quite a comment on our modern marketplace. If we can go to the next slide, please. Let's look at consumer debt counselling. Um, this is, of course, a particular problem in many markets. Uh, let's take Russia as an example where filing for personal bankruptcy can cost over $1,000. Um, Non-payment of debt, of course, in many countries is a criminal matter. And there's typically no debt relief um, legal framework and often re restructuring debt is based on sort of voluntary cooperation of financial services providers. So here, consumer advocates typically develop plans or even engage with creditors. And you can see 
you know, Thailand working with about 10 to 20 consumers per day. Um, and uh, FNAX, uh, we believe, have supported over 130 uh, consumers just in the past couple of months in 2020. Next slide, please. That brings, of course, a lot of insight um, about specific uh, needs. And I've seen some comments about, you know, is this just lumping consumers together as one group? Absolutely not. There's a, a lot of sensitivity to different cases and different concerns um, and, and different situations. Um, but often that can be put together into some common messages about what's really happening on the ground. Um, around, for example, telecommunications quality of service or data privacy uh, in places where we don't necessarily hear. Um, and the case study here is from Russia, where putting together a mystery shopper shopping experience in 20 regions in Russia can then be used to effect change. Um, in this case, uh, CONFOPA continue to push because the standard is not felt to be sufficiently uh, supportive of consumers. Next slide, please. Of course, this has to be um, uh, brought together with awareness raising, financial education. And I would like to say from other work we've done that um, typically when combined with uh, explanation of consumer rights, uh, this can create a really interesting change. When you know that you have consumer rights, um, you are potentially more ready to ask for uh, change as a person in the marketplace. Um, in these cases, uh, there are a variety of media used to reach out, uh, needs to be relevant to the location, of course. And in addition, consumer advocates will get engaged in uh, official initiatives and strategies around financial education. On the right, we picked some of these which focus in on uh, gender, particularly. Um, Rosemary has talked uh, beautifully about the, the 336 groups around Zimbabwe which uh, focus on um, a range of financial education. And Cuts in India works in 1,400 villages. Next slide. Um, the consumer voice in policy making is perhaps where this really comes into its own. Uh, most are involved, and it's lovely hearing about the UK, where of course there's one out of four groups advising that's focused on consumer. Um, but typically this isn't uh, as formalized or as structured as it could be. Um, when that happens, it can be magic. Uh, we have heard about a rosemary working over, I think it was from six years to a decade to drive the Consumer Protection Act in Zimbabwe. Um, and uh, examples, for example, Adakor in Rwanda seeking consumer grassroots input to draft financial consumer protection law just this year. Uh, IDEC, we've heard um, uh, fantastic examples from Teresa during this call. And next slide. Finally, um, we can look at public interest litigation. This is when things fall apart. Uh, unfortunately, uh, consumer organizations can know seek redress and rulings in the courts, uh, typically dependent on the national system and ability uh, of, the, of consumer advocacy to represent uh, in a fairly complicated process, typically. You can see the example of Consumers Lebanon on the right, which is uh, currently in process, bringing legal action against the Lebanese Bankers Association. And uh, we've been inspired recently by VZBV in Germany, uh, representing 2,400, 240, excuse me, 240,000 consumers in Germany in Dieselgate with their new consumer protection law. Coming to a close, uh, common challenges, if we can move to the next slide are, of course, those mentioned by uh, CETA and Graham to date. Um, these are organizations which are trying to help with just to help consumers from a, uh, a non-biased perspective. Our only bias is that people should be protected and empowered. Therefore, there are a lot of topics typically to cover, and it requires a focus. This requires also working over long periods of time uh, to try and influence and uh, with limited funding, so it requires a lot of ingenuity and innovation. 
and many working through crisis. I'd just like to mention that um, at the moment, of course, you are seeing around the world a vast increase in consumers calling our members asking for help. And uh, that has been one of the key things where we have been uh, focused over the past month. But let's focus on the opportunities. Next slide, please. Uh, there is clearly an opportunity to use the information and insight in a uh, clever way, leveraging technology. There's clearly a way to systematize how we give input to policymaking, and that will probably require some clever partnerships between consumer advocates in high income and other countries and with technical experts who can help us. And then next slide, please. As we look to the future, this has to be about shaping a very rapidly evolving financial services environment. Um, is green finance really green? Uh, how do we make regulation truly agile and inclusive? And how do you design new business models so that they are around consumer rights? Increasingly, 40% of those responding to the survey talked about how they are talking directly to business now because um, talking with regulators can take time. And finally, uh, with thanks to CGAP, this has obviously been a great opportunity to uh, think about how we address this as Consumers International. So on the last slide, just a few uh, uh, ideas um, of the many included in our report to CGAP. Um, clearly, we want to push to modernize, use, use new tools, communicate the value, and create the global network that's needed um, for consumers everywhere. We would strongly encourage that policymakers take advantage of this and, and if they wish to have people-centered policy, um, think about how we strengthen this global movement. Final slide, glad to hear feedback from the group. Delighted to continue uh, work and thank you and, uh, to all of you who have taken an interest in this important topic for the future. Thank you, back to you, Matt. Thank you so much, Helena. Um, that was wonderful. I, um, rather than pause here for questions, um, we're going to save those for the end just because we're running um, a bit, a bit uh, behind on timing uh, with the technical challenges. But I'll just pause for just a, just a second just to, to, because there's a lot of interesting discussions happening in the chat. And so I just want to acknowledge and, and recognize some of those. Um, some questions about uh, the resource, the question of resources for consumer associations. Um, uh, there was also a discussion about the, the differences between customer empowerment and, and consumer empowerment and consumer voice. Um, and then also there were a few questions about the relationships uh, uh, between regulators and consumer associations and, and a bit more um, interested in some more details on that. Um, so that the last question, I think, um, tees us up very well for Mary's presentation. Um, but please continue to, to, to submit questions on the chat, and either panelists will respond directly in the chat, or um, at the end, um, in, after after Mary finishes her presentation, then we can we can direct some more questions for panelists to respond to uh, over the with with, uh, with the audio. So with that, um, I'll hand it over to Mary. Thank you. Great. Greetings, everyone. Um, th those are nice segues from Helena and uh, Matthew to what we're going to be talking about, and that's opportunities for regulators. Uh, next slide, please. So we've been hearing about the collective consumer voice, um, and as you can tell, and as we know, it comes through many channels. So we're going to discuss how the consumer voice comes through and can be embraced and enhanced by regulators. Uh, obviously, the consumer voice helps regulators. It provides insights about the needs and outcomes in the marketplace. And as Matthew discussed earlier, we're looking at this customer outcomes approach to regulation. So it's very difficult to be successful in the regulation if you don't have, as people have mentioned, uh, the consumer voice at the table and in the room. It's also a way to identify what the regulator can provide for con consumers. For example, uh, some regulators have debt counseling services because uh, to address debt problems in the country. 
Uh, so it's a great way for the regulator to understand what they need to provide to consumers as well. And it supports informed and balanced decision making, which obviously is important and helps ensure participatory and collaborative policy making. And as we've been focusing on the poor, we're talking about raising particularly the voices of the poor who are often underrepresented uh, in policy forms. Next slide, please. So the, the consumer voice has been recognized uh, for many, many years. There, there is a heightened interest now uh, over the past few years as a result of the financial crisis and as what we're seeing in COVID to really understand what's happening on the ground. Um, in the, the Brazil's uh, framework of financial citizenship, they mentioned um, a, the fourth pillar is participation. Uh, it's necessary to give people voice on financial services issues. And you've heard Teresa talk about it. It might not be enough, but they're recognizing that, and not only to intensify public consultation, but also to explore the data held by regulators and the regulated institutions to understand, uh, getting back to cut consumer segments, what's happening to people in the marketplace on the ground. The ASEAN, uh, high level principles of consumer protection. This isn't specific to financial services, but focuses not only on making sure that the consumer voice is representative, but really saying to, to government, this is an affirmative obligation. You need to seek out and find those uh, consumer voices. Uh, next slide, please. So we've been looking at the very various ways that can happen, uh, both what's happening and then just thinking about ways to do it. We are obviously aware of all the various capacity and resource constraints issues happening around the world. So what we're talking about uh, goes from the UK example, uh, which uh, has a lot of resources attached to it, um, to very small things that wouldn't take a lot of resources but could have a lot of impact. So although this isn't sequential, we just tried to create a framework or categorization of some of the ways that regulators can engage the consumer voice. Um, you can build awareness. This is kind of the simple step. You, if you don't know who you're dealing with or who are having problems in the marketplace, it's a little bit difficult to create policy for them. So just developing communication channels some regulators have dedicated consumer offices. Uh, some people have financial education offices or financial inclusion offices. All those offices can be used for feedback and looping both to the consumers and uh, from the consumers. So it's, it's good if regulators identify and reach out to consumer segments and the representatives through technology or provider channels. Again, going out to the field, going to rural areas, meeting with groups, meeting with consumers, hearing from them. And I think everyone needs to always remember that the communications must be appropriate to who you're trying to communicate to. So if you're communicating digitally to places where they don't have access, that might not be the most appropriate way to communicate. And um, tracking participation and input across the agency, again, this is kind of creating discipline around the inputs so agencies can tell better what's happening. Uh, complaints are a key way of providing input, but complaints don't tell the whole story. At my home agency at the U.S. Uh, Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, we even have a portal called Tell Your Story so people can just come on and tell us what's happening. We also have a lot of outreach going on, so we're constantly meeting with groups and consumers to find out what's happening on the ground, how we can help, and whether or not the things we're doing are working as they're supposed to work. So key to that is ensuring consultation. We've heard a variety of different ways that people are consulting. Rosemary talked about being on different boards and panels. Um, but again, the regulators need to do outreach about the policymaking process, make sure that people understand what the policy making they're talking about is. Financial services, as many people have mentioned, is very complex and complicated and evolving extremely rapidly. 
So the language you use in inviting people or the timing you use or the channels you use are critical to making sure. So that gets back to knowing who your consumers are. Um, the earlier Graham talked about the, uh, the role of the panel in consulting very early in the process. Uh, the industry has, has often been engaged quite early in proposals and consumer groups can play a critical role in not only accessing draft proposal, but providing ideas for those proposals. Um, transparency and use of plain language to convey complex subjects, as I mentioned. Transparency is key. Uh, people might be thinking that people know what's going on, but you always need to check to make sure that your processes in the regulatory context are transparent. Open access to data is critical. I know in our agency we have um, open access to our complaint data, which has been extremely important, not only for research, researchers and consumer advocates, but the industry looks at that um, to gain insights on how, uh, how their products are working on the ground. It's, it's critical. And then I think we can't forget how, how important convenings are to promoting collaboration. By convenience, I don't necessarily mean you just bring a consumer group. I mean that you think about, regulators think about all the different co consumer segments that might be affected. If you're working on payments, do you have micro-entrepreneurs in the room? Do you have informal workers in the room? Do you have women in the room, women's groups? So it's really about making sure that you're talking to them and you're bringing them into the consultative process. We're also looking at formalizing these processes more We've heard um, from Graham about the board, about the panel, and Rosemary sits on the board. There are a host of examples, and I'm going to get into that um, in a moment. But the last thing that, that you hear about, um, and is obviously a constraint for many, is the funding side. So there's various ways to provide funding, and a little can go a long way. Uh, the survey, Consumers International Survey, showed that there are many people who participate on these various informal or formal consumer advisory panels, um, and they think they can be quite influential. But on the other hand, very few apparently get funding. Um, this, is, this is a lot of time is involved for people. They have to uh, prepare. They have to learn often complicated topics. So just funding um, to provide that participation is essential. Uh, research and expertise that reflects the consumer voice, funding different surveys by different groups, consumer groups, women's groups, uh, anyone you need to find out about um, that, will, that will help bring that voice in. And sometimes people forget about how critical a whole variety of different types of research and surveys can be uh, to, to the broader um, debate and policy making. And then, of course, supporting feedback and advisory and information channels directly to consumers through consumer organizations and others. Um, uh, consumers International, I think, mentioned the other idea is seconding uh, uh, someone from a consumer association to the, to the agency. We do that at CFPB, and it is always wonderful to have those folks in the room because they remind us every time we have the discussion about wait a second, when I'm working with people on the ground, that's not happening, or maybe that is happening, or maybe here's an idea. Uh, next slide, please. So I just mentioned that we're looking at, um, and we've, we've heard from Graham and others about these uh, structures. Uh, they can take many forms. They can be more cons consultative in nature, or they could be providing different services, advisory, complaint handling, things like that. But anybody can sort of turn into a consultative body. If you think about all the experiences, information that's coming in can be captured and brought into the policymaking arena. It just requires uh, discipline and thought and making sure that the consumer voice um, is, is top of the line. So the various models, I'm just looking at the time, the various models um, we looked at uh, in, in Independent consumer council agency, that could be external or internal. As Graham said, his is part of the FCA, but you can have outside ones. 
I know in the U.S. there are some utility councils, and they actually represent the consumer interest in rate hearings, which can be very, very uh, effective. The consultative bodies can be statutory, or they could be more ad hoc. It depends on the needs. Obviously, statutory can be very, very helpful um, for consistency and continuity. Um, as Graham said, they have a specific consumer advisory panel. Some panels are consumer and industry together, and some are consumer alone. Um, we think that uh, the consumer alone can, can just ensure that the consumer voice isn't um, watered down at all or sort of beat out by, by stronger, more powerful interests. Um, consultative bodies, as I mentioned, there could be ad hoc bodies. Uh, Australia has some of those. Canada has some of those. Um, it depends. And again, this is this is an ongoing project. So if folks have have knowledge or ideas, please let us know. There's also the funding, as I mentioned, of uh, consumer associations that can come in different forms. Funding an apex consumer association that then can create networks of and communication channels to to other uh, consumer associations. And then just providing different types of funding for different services or, or purposes can be very helpful to build capacity for consumer associations and make sure that you are that the regulator that the regulator can, can continue to hear from them. A next slide, please. I'm just kind of And Mary, we're just gonna yeah, yeah, we just have a couple minutes. Yeah. Um, so next yeah. so what what I wanna um sort of end with is What's on everyone's mind these days is technology and how technology can be used. Um, obviously, we're seeing the role of digital. So here are just a couple areas of, that we've been looking at. We think it's essential to meet people where they are, uh, customized to elevate. The CFI at Axion has done some great work in African countries using radio, training journalists on financial services, which is a really um, innovative, great idea. Twitter analysis to gain consumer insights. Devar has been using that to find out what's happening in the market during COVID. And then submitting complaints via social media platform, particularly when uh, in areas where many poor people are on, are on social media, it's a wonderful way, uh, including by sending pictures to submit complaints. And regulators should really think expansively about using information and technology for insights. It's not about, you know, you have a lot of different agencies that, uh, fellow agencies uh, that you can call upon. For example, in Canada, the statistics department uses crowdsourcing to survey, uh, do some quick surveys during COVID. As I said, in the U.S., we use public complaints data. And you can also, which is happening now, think about non-financial or proxy data to provide insights to what's happening in the financial arena. And then we're also seeing uh, a, a lot more activity in the private online complaint tool, uh, South Africa. We've talked to Hello Peter, and there's uh, one called Resolver in the UK and coming in India. These are ways to, to bridge between providers and regulators and consumers. Again, um, can provide some real insights very quickly. I'm gonna end it there. But just want to invite everyone to, if you have information or insights, to please send them along. Thanks. Thank you so much, Mary. Um, and as you can see, we're, we're due to the technical challenges, we're running a little, a little bit behind. Um, but fortunately, the the question and answer has we've all kind of uh, worked with what we had, and people have been responding very well in the um, in the chat. So we've we've been able to get some responses. From panelists, so thank you for for um, uh, submitting those, and, and thank you to the panelists for responding. Um, so I, I'm going to just hand it over now to Herard to to wrap us up, um, and please continue to submit your comments in the chat. We're going to save all of those, and and um, and it's it's really helpful for us to to hear about how this all resonates with you, and any ideas that you have about how we can go about this work. Um, so with that, I'll hand it over to Herard. Thank you, Matthew. Uh, just give me a quick sound check. You can hear me now. Perfectly. Excellent, excellent. Thanks all for joining us and engaging in such a lively discussion on the chat function.
even though we didn't get to answering a lot of those questions verbally, I see there was a gallant effort to do that. And please do not hesitate to contact us uh, afterwards so that we can continue those discussions. I hope we all come away feeling inspired about the potential for the financial inclusion community to take a closer look at ways to strengthen the collective, consu collective consumer voice. And we take note of all those comments that, uh, that asked us to unpack this a little bit, to think more about the vulnerable segments and how can we empower them and give them agency. So thanks for those comments. This all can help us reach our shared goal of an inclusive and responsible financial sector. A special thanks to our speakers and panelists. Thank you for sharing your experiences and expertise with us and thanks for uh, taking on the challenge of technology. As for CGAP's plans, we are working on synthesizing the lessons from this initial research and sharing those out in a publication in the fall. Um, we are also in the process of identifying potential pilots or experiments to demonstrate how regulators, civil society organizations, and international funders could scale up or bolt upon the successful strategies and tools we've heard highlighted today and also the challenges we've heard. Please do get in touch if you are interested in staying up to date or you have ideas for future uh, work. Thank you again to Consumers International for their invaluable contributions and for partnering with us on this webinar and the research. After the webinar, you will receive a feedback form. We will be very grateful for your responses. And all that's left for me to say is goodbye and thank you, everybody. Have a great remainder of your day. Thank you.